Hi, welcome back students. Um, again, my name is Dr. Elisa Alvarado and I'm here with Mr. Ronnie Osuna, PharmD, and he's also the pharmacy clinical coordinator at DHR Health. So before we get started with asking Ronnie some fun questions, um, I'm just gonna review a little bit about uh, the segment. Just want to remind the students that this is a live segment, so you do have the possibility of asking questions. So feel free to submit your questions throughout the interview, and you can submit them by scanning the QR code uh, on the screen or by going to www.menti.com and using the access code 4794784. and 4. Um, again, you can also submit questions using uh, the QR code. So before we get started, Ronnie, just a little bit about the PATS program. Um, PATS stands for Pathways Aligned for Health Science, and it's a Perkins Federal Reserve Grant that's funded by the TEA. This is currently our second year of the PATS program, and this is the first time that we actually welcome middle school students uh, awesome. to participate. Uh, we have 10 school districts that are participating, um, and there's four counties. And currently, we also, this year, included elementary school. Wow. So we're really excited to have all of these students here, and uh, particularly the middle school students that are going to be transitioning into high school. Um, so just a little bit um, of history. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where are you from, and um, what got you here today? Sure, thank you, Lisa. Thank everybody for being here this morning. Uh, great opportunity to get information on pharmacy and the pharmacy profession. I'm Ron Ozuna, I'm born and raised in McAllen. Um, have lived here all my life, Went obviously went away for school, did, did some schooling. Uh, I'm a Mackay Bulldog, graduated from McAllen High School. Uh, at that point, decided to, to go and pursue my undergraduate degree at Texas A&M University. So I got an undergraduate degree, my bachelor's in science uh, in biology at Texas A&M University. And then came back and I taught. I was a teacher for two years, high school, physical science and chemistry here in, in the local area. And during that time is where I made my decision to go into pharmacy school. Pharmacy school was in a transition at that point was going from a bachelor's degree to a doctorate degree and kind of pursued that pathway. Went to the University of Texas at Austin and did my pharmacy schooling there and did my internship in San Antonio at the Health Science Center in San Antonio. Immediately after that, went and worked in Dallas for uh, about a year and a half and did some clinical pharmacy work there with Presbyterian Dallas uh, in downtown Dallas. And then decided to come back home where I felt that I was a resource and, and could help our community and our patients down here and started to work at uh, Rio Grande Regional Hospital. Worked there for about eight years and that's just south of, of DHR. And I've been here at DHR as a, in, in a clinical coordinator position for going on 11 years now. And then there's been some transition there too that I'll speak about in terms of my career uh, in integrating some of the academics and things like that that we are now a part of through affiliated through the University of Houston College of Pharmacy. So uh, wonderful, wonderful path. I've, I've, I've had obviously uh, changes of, 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 of minds and things of that sort along the way, but where I've ended up I think has been a, a, a good result and, and we're here taking care of our patients, our community that eventually when you make your decision in, in your healthcare profession or, or otherwise, you can help our community here in the Valley, so. So, Ronnie, I know that, you know, you you make it sound easy, you know, you went to a and <laughs> and then you went to UT and then you came back, but what does it take? I mean, to get into these programs and yeah. really as um, a high school student or a student that's choosing uh, pharmacy or choosing any type of healthcare career, what kind of grades did you have to get? And, yeah. and were you discouraged in school? Was it hard when you left? And, and just a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, I, th I think it's, it's not difficult if you have good work ethic. If you work hard and you're disciplined, I think anybody can actually do it. Um, it is very competitive to get into pharmacy school. So starting now in middle school and getting through high school, make sure that you're, that you're tackling your core courses, which are math, science, Englishes, 
and doing good in those core courses because those are the ones that actually help you and make you competitive to uh, to get into pharmacy school. Pharmacy school takes an application. You don't get automatically accepted because of a GPA. You have to go through a certain process. But the GPA is very important. So grades are very important starting off. That's number one. But there's also a personal component there, and it's your work ethic, your dedication, your determination, your passion for the profession. That plays a huge role when you apply to pharmacy school. And that comes through in your interview, when you interview for pharmacy school. There was a, there's another component in getting into pharmacy school, pharmacy school and that's, that's a PCAT. That's a pharmacy uh, entrance exam that you have to take. Some colleges have waived that since COVID and since enrollment has dropped a little bit because of the market in pharmacy. Mm -hmm. uh, PCATs have been waived for certain universities, but there is a PCAT test that needs to be taken. And that score is very important for the applicant getting into pharmacy school. You have to be competitive. You're competing against about 400, 500 students that are applying to a certain college of pharmacy. So it's a big pool. You're competing against a good group of individuals. And consider this, because we're from the Rio Grande Valley. We're a large area. We're about a million people if you take care, a little over a million people if you look at the entire RGV. So we're a nice metropolitan area, if you will. But you're competing against other students in the state. You're competing against students that are in Dallas, Houston, Austin. And let me tell you this, you are just as competitive as those students if you just work hard. So I know that a lot of times when I do... Um these live sessions with doctors and nurses. And I always, uh, the students always ask me to ask, how much do they, how much do they make? You know, <laughs> is there, is there jobs, you know, is there jobs for us if we go into that yeah. field or is it going to be one of those things where you spend a lot of time and then you get out and then you can't find employment? Yes. Um, and is it something that, um, you know, your wage increases with your experience or do you just right off the bat um, enter? And is it different if they go from a pharmacist working at, let's say, a CVS to a pharmacist working at UTRGV or a hospital? Um, so a lot of uh, the questions initially that we get kind of revolve around that because students <laughs> yeah. really want to know, like, if I'm going to be investing time and effort you know, what is my outlook like? And I know that salaries differ and that, um, you know, healthcare careers differ. So I always try to tell them it's not going to be the same thing. But undoubtedly, if I don't ask that question, I will get the Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, Lisa. Yeah, I, I think the first thing to consider is is picking a career that you love. And I think Veronica, our technician that, you'll, that you've heard of already uh, present, you, you need to have passion for what you're doing. It doesn't become work if you love it. When you go into work and you love what you're doing and you get in there, sometimes the intangibles, which we talk about, like the salary and, and, and those types of things, go out the window. There's decisions that you're going to have to make, obviously, from a financial standpoint. I can tell you that pharmacy pays very well. You're going to make a very, very good living in pharmacy. Uh, as a doctorate, you gotta you gotta remember you've you've put in you've invested about at least six years of your of your life in in schooling, so that has to get compensated somehow. The other thing, it's not only your your commitment and your investment in the school or in your schooling or your academics, but it's the liability we have as pharmacists that you get paid for. It's very, very important that you consider that the end result of what happens within this pharmacy process as pharmacists and we're practicing on a daily basis is that patient, is the patient that we're caring for. That requires a lot of patience, focus, determination on a daily basis to be able to make sure that what, how we're treating the patients is the best way possible. There's an error that ever occurs that results in a patient negative outcome. So it's, it's not all about just pharmacy. It's about treating patients and treating them well. And because of that, a pharmacist does earn pretty good money. And I can tell you it ranges depending on the setting. It ranges whether you're in 
the community setting like Walmart, Walgreens. It, it, it also ranges if you're working for a facility. It ranges if you're working for a university. It ranges if you're working for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, it ranges if you're working as a nuclear pharmacist or a compounding pharmacist. But I can tell you the range is probably anywhere between $60 an hour to all the way up to about $70 an hour. That averages, I mean, if you look at an entire year, that's about one hundred and twenty to about $140,000, $150,000 a year. But again, it's not the money. It's the passion you have for the profession, the passion that you have for those patients that you want to that you want to care for and you want to care for in the most optimal way that you can so and Ronnie I have another question and I, and I know I'm I'm keeping close tabs on the time because sure. I know we have a short segment but um, I've seen a lot of reports uh, particularly when the pandemic first started mm -hmm. um, and about how people didn't understand what pharmacy, uh, what pharmacists actually did to help in um, the distribution of the vaccine. So a lot of people think they bring the vaccine and you just need somebody to administer the vaccine. But that's not the case, right? Pharmacists play a really big role. And I think, you know, for uh, the students that are watching us today, it's important to know that it's part of the healthcare team. Um, so a lot of what we say when we talk about careers in health science is that one part of the team really isn't going to be successful without the other part of the team. So tell us a little bit about kind of the, the unsung heroes in pharmacists uh, through this COVID-19 and, and with, um, with the fact that you have to actively be involved in the uh, preparation of the vaccine. Absolutely. And in, in the different different capacities that we serve as pharmacists in the hospital. Um, you know, you have the managerial capacities, you have the supervisors like us that coordinate things. We're a we have a clinical component. Pharmacy is no longer right behind the counter counting pills. We are a healthcare team and we work with physicians, nurses. We take care of patients, side-by-side -side physicians on a daily basis. That's what I do with our infectious disease doctors. So when we care for patients as a team, we kind of integrate everybody in the decision making for the patient care. Now, in terms of COVID, we were a huge resource. We're a team. We work as a team. We we became the resources for the doctors. There were new drugs that were coming out. There were new vaccines that were coming out that we had to get familiar with. We had to do some research. We had to investigate these drugs and be able to communicate that to physicians as to how to utilize these medications to cure our patients. And that deals with all the medications that came out for COVID. So I can see that pharmacy played a humongous role. We were actually leading the medication. We were the leaders in the medication resource. So I'd sit right side by side physicians saying, hey, this is the way we have to use this med. This is how we have to use it to cure this patient. And then this is the way we have to use it to cure this patient or treat this patient. So played a huge role. We were a lead resource. We still are. We are leading the vaccination campaign. We've vaccinated over 100,000 patients to date, and we're doing that right outside these doors, right outside in, in, in our outpatient setting, and, and we're leading that. Pharmacists are using the optimal scope of their practice. We, we literally are, are vaccinating patients. We're teaching patients about these new meds that are out, and we have huge number of questions that are coming through our facility on everything that's happening with COVID. So I can say that we do it on a daily basis anyway, but we've taken a step up in having to take care of all of the new medications and things that have come out to treat patients that have COVID. And Ronnie, to wrap up, I know that uh, we have live questions that may be coming in that we're gonna answer, but I guess, my main question is what inspired you or what is your inspiration for being a pharmacist and what is the future of your field like? 
for me, it was really just wanting to get into the healthcare system to treat patients. I, I know I wanted to be in the healthcare system. Initially, I wanted to be a physician. And that's why I said, you know, you have your decision making along your path. If you know you want health care, there's multiple areas that you can choose. Pharmacy was it for me after I looked at medical school. I thought medical school was for me, kind of did everything to get in there. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to go be a doctor of pharmacy and, and, and try that profession out. But I always had the passion to be a healthcare professional. Uh, pharmacy has now grown. We are no longer dispensing and that it, those pharmacists that are in Walgreens, CVS, Walmart, I'm putting plugs in for those companies, but, uh, you know, they dispense. They take care of the medication. They handle the medication. As hospital pharmacists, we do clinical work, side-by-side -side nurses and physicians with the patient right in the center. And I think that's where the pharmacy profession is going. As a doctor of pharmacy, you're going to be treating patients one-on-one, -on -one, side by side. And in pharmacy, coming very, very soon, you're going to be able to be writing prescriptions for patients, vaccinating patients like we're doing now, and in, in embracing everything that, we, that physicians can actually do. We do not assess patients, but we're able to change medication therapies, write prescriptions, and move forward. We're doing that now through collaborative agreements with pharmacy. That's why the pharmacy career has grown. That's why the, the education has actually gotten a little uh, more intense on the clinical side because we're, actually, we're, we're frontline healthcare providers that are now able to take care of patients one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, so. Well, um, thank you so much, Ronnie, for uh, joining us today and sharing your insight with our PATH students. And, um, of course, we wish you continued success, and we thank, thank DHR Health for um, having professionals such as yourself. Um, students, we hope that you enjoyed this session and that you took some notes. Um, I'm going to be checking to see if there were some questions. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see, there's a lot of different ones, so... Uh, <laughs> let's see. Okay, I guess some of the ones that are here are kind of related, and um, they they deal with patient care. They ask if pharmacists have uh, any control over or if um, there is any protocol for patients that get hooked on certain medications, um, whether it be that you work at CVS and you notice something or whether it's you're working at the hospital and you see a recurring patient. Um, is there um, protocols you have to follow, um, and does that happen often? Yeah, I'm, we, we get that occasionally. It doesn't happen often, but we do get those patients that obviously have medication-related issues that we have to address. Uh, there's regulatory pieces that we have to follow. So, yes, there is a protocol. There's regulatory like agencies. We have an opioid stewardship committee that meets to handle certain things that we do with controlled substances, and those are narcotics, pain meds, things like that, that have the, the potential to be abused by patients. So we handle those particular medications very, very carefully, very securely, and we obviously utilize them very carefully for our patient to make sure that we're treating the patient and ensuring that we, they don't they're not diverted and they're not abused. Um, a really good question that came up that we actually didn't touch on is when you went to um, undergrad and graduate school, was financial aid available for you? And um, what type of loans did you have to take or did you or do you have now that you're paying off? Um, yeah. I guess they're more interested in understanding how to pay for sure. this type of uh, education. Sure, absolutely. There's loans that I had to take out. I come from a very humble beginning. I had to borrow money through federal loans, uh, through grants, and, and those are available to you. 
the one thing that I will tell you is take advantage of scholarships because scholarships are hugely important. And, and you're competitive for scholarships, whether it's academic, whether it's community service, whether it's other things. Seek those particular scholarships because they assist you tremendously. I was lucky to have an academic scholarship to A&M, and that's what kind of paid for my school at Texas A&M. But it was because I... I dedicated myself to my school in high school when I was there. I was salutatorian of my high school, and I was able to get money to go to A&M and pursue my, my undergraduate uh, education. So a lot of different things. We have local resources that will give you uh, scholarships to be able to, to come back and, and practice here in the Valley. Uh, there are scholarships for the University of Houston College of Pharmacy that I represent uh, that are available locally as well. So multiple areas that we can tap into to assist the financial uh, challenges that you may have uh, as a student, as a family, because we know that at, that is, is, a, is a big, big challenge for all of us. And, and, and there is assistance, so just keep that in mind. There's assistance, and I would, I would encourage all of you now early on to start looking at, 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 at the potential to, to get some of these scholarships that are accessible. Okay, so one last question. Um, they want to know how long or what's your schedule like? Like, do you have like a nine to five with a one hour lunch or do you work uh, certain shifts or what is your a day in the life of sure. um, for you? I'll, gi I'll give you a quick rundown. For me, it's, it's, it's a different capacity. I'm, I'm one of the clinical managers or, or the clinical manager for my department. So I'm at a supervisory level along with the director. <clears throat> and, and for me, it's, it's, it's observational. I have my clinical team. I have my pharmacists. I have my pharmacy technicians that work with, uh, that, that I have to work with on a daily basis. But is it, it is shift work. A lot of our operational pharmacists work certain shifts. And then they leave. We replace them with another pharmacist that comes in later on in the day. And then there's some pharmacists that work overnight. We're a 24-7 pharmacy in the hospital. So we have pharmacists that alternate shifts. <clears throat> and then we have technicians that do the exact same thing. For me, I'm a Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. And that's just because I'm at the managerial level. But it doesn't end at 5 when you're a manager. You obviously have to stay connected with the pharmacy and be able to to handle any issues, any questions that come up throughout the, the evening. So I'm consistently on my phone, on my email, and things like that. But I'm, I'm, uh, as a manager, I have a Monday through Friday 8 to 5 shift. Uh, for CVS, Walmart, Walgreens, you know, those shifts differ as well. But there are shifts that you, have, you go in, you clock in, you clock out. So um, it can vary depending on the setting. Uh, and I... I've enjoyed my Monday through Friday where I'm able to have my weekends off and my, my afternoons off. It's taken some time to get to a managerial role. You don't start there. You have to start as a pharmacist and work through your shifts. And once you, you prove yourself and gain experience, you move up the ladder. So, uh, you know, I, I, could, I bet there's a, tons of managers that are out there in the audience right now that, that are going to work hard to get to, to these types of positions. So uh, I encourage you to continue to work hard, work on your academics. Uh, you know, I'm going to retire soon. I, 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 I want one of you guys to come and take my seat. So, <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Ronnie, for talking to us today. And students, we hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. Again, thank you to DHR Health for having these wonderful professionals available. Um, so now we're scheduled for the lunch. The conference uh, will resume at 1. So until then, take a little break, and we'll see you back at 1. Thank you.